nice to see you here. And also after the Flick Summer event, I hope everyone is still uh, like getting better again. Um, I want to talk about Project Orleans, what it is, and, and why you should care about it. And I'd really like to make this a discussion, so please participate if I ask you a question, or and also ask me questions if you, if you have them, and not just at the end. So um, if you look at how we usually handle web requests, it usually follows the same pattern, even if it's in PHP or Java or any other language. Like request comes in, you load some state, either from the database or maybe from some cache if, you, if, you're, if the database is too slow. You do some processing. Maybe you save some state back to the database and then you send out a response. So this is how we always do it. And usually we don't challenge this. But now I ask you, if you could change anything about how this works, what would you change? <laughs> yeah, I think you still want to send a request. Yeah, I can also really like. Uh, I said, do not send the request. Yeah, okay. Processing. Usually, I mean, let's, for example, let's pick, uh, I mean, we could pick, for example, our pricing guys. I mean, what they do is they do, I think, 60,000 requests per second to the databases just to get the current state into the system, then do some processing on it, and send out the response, right? Do not load state. <laughs> yeah. Do not load state, exactly. So how, how would this would look like if we do not load state? Oh, wait, um, this is one too far. So let's say we could do the following. We load the state at the beginning. We get a request in. We do our processing, send out the response, and then save the state. So we just change a bit in the ordering here, which to us, usually this is kind of hard to do, right? In, in a usual way, because you need to know, usually you need to know before you get a request what data to load. And that is what data would you load. You can, I mean, of course, you would load all the data. This is one, one approach. But it gets more interesting, because if you already have the state loaded, well, why not just accept another request? Do the processing, send out a response, and maybe just then save the state, because maybe you don't need to save the state all the time, only, only once. So why don't we do this? Any idea why, why we don't do this? PHP. <laughs> <laughs> PHP. PHP is a good answer, right? Because PHP, usually you do one request, well, your PHP dies, and then you start all over again. But this is built on purpose in, in PHP. But in Java, for example, you don't need to do this, but you still do it, usually. I'm just, I'm not that like, good in surflets, like beans and everything. Uh, the state is too big to hold in memory. The state is too, too, too big to hold in memory. Yeah, that could be an issue if you're a really large state. What if you have multiple machines? Could it then be an issue? You need to have shard in order to know where to get the state from. Exactly. I mean, if, if you have five servers and they all keep the state in memory, like locally, and have it loaded, the, I mean, the state might diverge. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think this was someone else. So the state might diverge, and I need to synchronize the state again. So I don't, I don't gain anything, right? Because then I spend all the time synchronizing the state and everything. But what if I told you that there is a way to do this, and that it actually works? And this is what Project Orleans is all about. Like, keep basically keeping, this, keeping the state or bringing your code, your processing, and your state together so, they, so you don't need to load it every time for every single request. And what people usually do, or like there's already a similar approaches for a long time ago, which is called the actor model, which is like, basically there's a schema of this on the, on the left side. And the idea here is that for every piece of state you have, let's say, for example, you have a write, and for this write, you create an actor in your, in, your, in your runtime environment, and this actor loads the state when it starts, and it, as long as this actor is living, it will keep the state in memory, in its own place. And it will get requests, do some processing, and send out a response again. And you never need to load, like in between, you don't need to load any new data, most probably, if your state is localized to the single entity, basically like an aggregate root, you could also say. Still following? So, but the problem is in this actor model is that usually you need to keep track of a lot of things. Because let's say, for example, your, maybe your process crashes, the actor crashes. Then you need to recreate it again. Um, 
and it means you need to like basically monitor those uh, those actors. And that's why you usually is a tree. It's a tree of mo of actors that monitor each other and keep each other alive. And need to there's frameworks around it, but you need to do a lot of programming around this. And the other problem is that usually also those actors or those those strays. I mean, this is kind of simple if you do it on a single machine. But if you want to distribute this out to multiple machines, that means you need to be able to message between those machines, those actors, which you can also do, which usually most of these actors frameworks have built in. But the other problem is you need to shard your actors between those different machines, right? You always need to know where's, for example, the actor for uh, write X, Y, Z. Where's the actor for write ABC? So you need to care all about these things. And Project Orleans goes on top of that and just says, all these actors, they call them virtual actors. And they say, okay, we just, you don't need to care about this. Just tell me what actors you have. I'm gonna put them anywhere. I'm gonna run them anywhere. I, you, you don't need to care about this at all. You don't need to care about the network. You don't need to care about keeping state. I'm gonna handle all of this for you. And this is like simplified here. So they call it silo, silo and grains. So the, the dots are the grains. So how does a grain look like? The first, you need to define an interface for your grain. For example, this is the price grain, and you can ask it for the current price. So there's a method current price you can call on the interface. Then the class here is the implementation for it. And the first thing you notice is that this, so this has an implementation current price. You get the string product, which we don't use here in this example. But so what we do is it will, every time you ask it for the current price, it will increase it by one. And the funny thing is that it keeps it state locally. So there's its own pricing variable and doesn't share it with any other actor in the system. And it also keeps it state. Between different requests, it will keep its, its instance variable, like you would expect it from object-oriented programming, basically. And how you would call it is that you, that you use this really long factory method, and you just tell it, hey, give me, give me the grain for this UUID. And then you can call on this, on this interface, so this is as the, implements this interface up here, you can just call the method current price and you, you will not even see the network call, so we just transparently we get the answer from this, from this um, grain. And the funny thing is this is all you need to do. You don't need to create a grain, you don't need to create an actor. It will implicitly create this actor if it doesn't exist yet in your system. Questions so far? What is this UID? It's just an identifier of the grain? This is, yeah, exactly. This is an identifier of the grain. So the, so the difference is, or the, what you need to is, every grain needs to have a ad unique identifier in the system. So this can be a string, an integer, or a UUID, what they support. And I picked UUID because that's, I mean, that's what we fancy now here, right? <laughs> I guess this might come later, but if the actor dies, the price goes where? Is there some storage in the back good, end? Good question. So the thing is, uh, the way this is currently written, if the actor would die for any reason, the price would reset and you, uh, next time you will, get, you will get the zero result. So what you need to do is, to, so I will get to make this later, persistence I will get back later. But let's just, call, like, let's go over what these multiple actors, but you need to have them so that they work. So you need to have an ID, so you can identify, identify them. Uh, they have so-called perpetual existence, so they always exist, and they never, so, as soon as you define the grain, there will always be the actor. So you don't you never ever need to care about if it exists or not. Basically, assumption is it always exists. Even if, for example, the ID doesn't exist in the other system, but as long as you don't call it, it will not get created, basically. Then there's automatic instantiation. So you expect if I call an actor that's not there yet, it will get created automatically. I have location transparency. I don't care where this, where this actor or this grain is located in my cluster. And I have automatic scale out. So, but this automatic scale out only works, of course, if my actor is stateless. Because, of course, if I have state my actor, I cannot just duplicate it and expect the same result. Um, and there's some so in case, so you have at least once delivery for the messages. So um, it could happen you get the same message twice if you if you do if you do the call twice or like once. Could happen you get it multiple times. Um, and the singleton guarantee fades in the error case, which I just want to have a disclaimer here because this is not magic. Of course, for example, if one node goes down, it will restart the grain on another node. You might have for a short time have duplicated grains running at the same time, which might be a problem or not. 
Um, also, you don't have like a FIFO guarantee for the message, or you don't, basically don't have any guarantee on the message ordering if you, if you send messages to other grains. So persistence. So persistence, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a code example here, but state is kept in a plain old data structure, so you basically define a struct or a class, define some properties on it, strings, integers, whatever you want. And if, you, if your grain gets started for the first time, or even after it was basically sent to sleep, it will load the state from the database and will populate the state automatically for you. The only thing you need to do is you need to do the checkpointing manually. So if, let's say, for example, the pricing case, maybe you want to save in your state, in your local state for the actor, uh, the contingent classes that you have, um, that you have in, in, in this write, or that are, that are for the segments. And you put it into your state, uh, and as soon as, uh, if, for example, for the grain crashes, or the server crashes, you get repopulated from this, from this state. Um, and there's multiple um, options to, for storage. So the, let's say the major storage options are supported. Um, of course, sometimes you want to use, not use the DynamoDB or uh, the Azure table because it's non-consistent. So sometimes you want to have the transaction guarantees of MySQL but you usually don't need it. And downside of here is that it has opaque storage, so you basically just save a blob in a database, and you cannot just, for example, query the database with all the data in there. So we lose the, like, some insights there. Any questions? No? Yeah. So if you assume that most actors are stored on different pods, what makes it different from just database? You mean what makes it different from the database? Yeah. That you can do computation on the data. So in your database, you cannot do computation, right? Yeah. Or it gets hard, let's put it this way. Yeah, but if you still have to call another pod to get data of actor. Ah, OK, OK. So the state here, this plain old data structure, is loaded into the actor. So this actor has a lifetime, and if an actor gets started, it will load the state from the database once, once. And usually, if, if for example, the only thing it, it would basically get shut down is either it doesn't get a new message or doesn't do anything for a long time, or if it, the node crashes for any reason. Does this answer your question? Not really. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, so as far as I understand, uh, actors are split on different pods. Yeah, it could be, if you do a cluster, basically, of, of the... Yes, yeah. so most probably, when you need an actor, you have to call another pod to get its data. It depends. I mean, at some point, you have a pod or, that, or has a, have a grain that has the data, right? Yes. Let's say, for example, I mean, uh, I have some use cases here. Let me see, do I actually have this here? Yeah, let's do the use cases. So a few use cases, how would, you, how would you use it in practice? Maybe this, this is easier to understand. So for example, pricing. What, what data do you need for pricing to make your pricing calculation? Classes. Conigent classes. Let's say, let's keep it, let's keep it uh, manageable. <laughs> so what you would do is you have, your, you have one actor per ride, for example. You load all the conigent classes in there. So this one actor, now this grain, can, can give you a decision on the price without calling any external data, right? And you could even go so far that it will cache the latest price it calculated. Because why would you recalculate the price the next time you're going to ask it for a price if, if the state didn't change? And if the state changes, for example, there was a booking, you send it a message, it will update its own internal state, maybe recalculate the price already, and the next time it gets asked, it can say, okay, now the price is for an adult, is, is this price here? Does this answer your question? You said one grain per uh, write? Yeah. So how many of them you need? How much? So, um, so the good thing is you can have a lot of actors. <laughs> so um, a single node can basically handle, I would say, easily a, a, a million active actors, um, and which usually doesn't become a problem because if you think about how many writes we have on sale on a, at a given time, then I would expect it to be less than a million. I'm not sure that's true, but in the end, you can then scale out the cluster. So basically, you can have a lot of grains in your, in your system, billions. 
So it really becomes feasible to say, I want an actor per right. I want an actor per customer or whatever. Maybe you will come to that later, but how does it handle concurrency? So um, concurrency uh, depends on what you do. So the good thing is, if we look back at the example here, is that inside of an actor, you don't have any concurrency at all, right? So this runs always on a single machine in a single thread. You don't need to care about concurrency at all. It be only becomes challenging if you have multiple actors um, working together, but I will come back to this later, basically, which is basically distributed transactions. Um, so this, for example, would be another use case for reservations. So it would be a similar model. You have those uh, contingent classes. I, I think it's contingent classes you need for reservations. You have an actor for every write, and you ask it, hey, please reserve, for example, for this user session, uh, like two seats. And the actor will do it internally, and the next time someone asks it, hey, how many free seats do you have? The actor can just reply, okay, I have five free seats. Of course, the problem is now if we have multiple rights and we want to reserve a right in multiple, uh, a seat in multiple rights at the same time and have a guarantee that, like, oh, maybe this one says, oh, yeah, I have two seats. This one says, oh, I don't have two seats. And the other one does it at the same time, so we get conflicts. And for this, you would need distributed transactions, which is right now not included in, in the project, but is in beta, basically. So they are working on having distributed transactions so you could reserve, have a guaranteed reserve on multiple rights, for example. Um, you could also do it using for payments. So payments, it would be easy for, so for every payment you have in your system, you start, a, you start a grain, the grain handles the communication with the payment provider, handles timeouts, handles error, and if it's done, it will send back a message to the, to the initiator. And you can always query it if, if there was a payment or not, or if it's ongoing or not. Speaking about payments, can you put state machine on top of these actors then? Yeah. So there is no framework for this right now, but it basically, I mean, if you want to have a state machine in there, I mean, I think there could actually be examples for this, but I mean, there's nothing speaks against it that you have like a variable here called current state. Like, I don't know, what's the usual states and payments, uh, captured, whatever, paid, canceled, whatever. You save it here and you can do your own thing. What you can also do, which I didn't talk about, is you can have timers in your actors. So you can say, hey, please send me a message in five minutes, wake me up, and if I don't, for example, get like an answer for, or like you could, for example, cancel the whole booking process after five minutes if, if nothing happens for whatever reason. Like yeah, basically like promises. I mean, this is all based on promises here, so you can see task from, so this is C Sharp, if you didn't notice yet. Uh, <laughs> it looks a bit like Java and like PHP. I mean, there's not much difference here, but it's C Sharp. Uh, if you say you can load, have an actor for each write, it means the current number of actors is also a state of this system. So it has to yes. be ma maintained somewhere. Imagine the system which controls the actors dies. Can it yeah. then, after the next start, understand which actors are there for which system? Or the whole actors will just die if the so, controlling procedure so, dies? So, so the thing is that basically, in, in the end, from a user perspective, from a developer perspective, there is no, the actor exists or not. You don't care because the moment you send it a message and ask it for something, it will create created if it's not there in the system yet. Which is also a good thing because you don't need to manage this. Like, like I said, if, for example, if you would uh, like have an actor for every payment in the system at some point when you have a billion uh, actors running and you kind of get into some system constraints. But the system will automatically shut down your old actors that didn't, for example, were inactive for like 24 hours. We shut them down and only if you ever send it a message again, it will wake them up again. So it's this perpetual existence property of it. You don't care if it's there or not when calling it. Any more questions? I think we had the... Uh, more questions? So is it possible to have same actor cached on several pods at the same time? No. The system will make sure that uh, one actor is, is ever exists uh, for a single ID only exists once. Okay. And how do you handle cache invalidation? <laughs> like if it's changed in database? So <laughs> the problem is we only have, I think, five minutes left. Oh, no, but it's like 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
maybe let's get to this later, but there's, I mean, there's ways to do it. But you need to rethink basically how you do it. So the, all right, let's just do it now. Um, so the idea is you don't have any caches because you don't need any caches because you, basically your actor is your cache. So if you need to cache any data, that is kept locally. Of course, you need to keep things local. If you have a single actor that would cache, for example, the data for, for everything, and then every other actor would always ask this one, hey, what's the answer, what's the current state? Then this is not a good design because then you possibly have like a thousand ones going to one single thing and you get a, you know, like a single point of failure in, a, in, your, in your cluster. So that's not something you should do. So you should distribute the data basically as evenly as possible um, and do that. And with the, if you say, okay, let's something like this, that you would say something changes in the databases, I mean, let's say, for example, it will be business events. Uh, this is an easier case to handle. This is actually a good case for business events. Because let's say you have a business event uh, line invariant changed, or like what's the line, uh, like this, you know, line, not this line variation, but like constraints, like this line constraints. Now you get a business event, okay, the line constraint for these lines. What you're going to do is you're going to send a message to every grain that's affected by this. And it would handle it and say, okay, I'm going to update my state and done. And you don't need to cache this data anywhere but in the grain that's actually affected. It would be one possible approach. Um, yeah, in other use cases. But in this case, what do you do? In this case, you somehow have to register all the affected lines in. I mean, there is a possibility of a race condition, I think, in this situation, because you can bring up a new actor before it registers, and then the update message doesn't get it there, and it has the old state. I mean, this po is... Possible, possible, but it depends, of course, on your data model is where you keep track of the rights that you have and, and do all this. But so it's a matter of architecting. Yeah, yeah, but you need to rethink how you architect your applications if you do, if you do it this way. Um, yeah, of course, another obvious use case would be a card. You have, a, you have an actor for every card in your system or in your, for, the, for every user, and you send it a message if some, something gets added to the card. It can send out messages, if, for example, if the, like, if the timeout is there for 15 minutes and it will send out a message to the booking system, hey, okay, or to reservation system, okay, please like, cancel these reserved seats because the session timed out. Uh, so, for example, for search, it's not a good use case because you don't process a lot of state in, in search. So it's really good if you have state and you want to keep it local and process it. So what are some downsides and risks of, of using it? Um, so bulk operations on a large number of entities are not easily possible because you need to send a message to every single grain that you want to update or query for some data. Of course, that gets slow. If you want to do something like give me, for example, all the rights in the system or all the reservations that have ever been in the system, you need to query every single grain, hey, please give me like, what happened. And this is not built for this. So you would want to basically, probably you want to write all this data into a data lake and then you can query the data lake for all this data. Um, yeah, extremely large numbers of grains, so billions uh, without temporal locality. So if you have a billions of active grains then things will also get hard. So, which I also don't think is usually a problem for us because most things don't live that long in our system. Uh, I mean, maybe if, I don't know, half a million rights on sale, but probably not a billion rights on sale at the same time. <laughs> and people booking at the same time <laughs> on all those rights. Um, yeah, then cross grain transactions or distributed transactions. Uh, so, for example, like I said, for the reservation system, you probably would want to have that if you don't want to implement it on your own. But this is uh, in beta, I think, right now. Um, then the tooling is a bit rough. So like I said, this is C-sharp. And as most of you know, C-sharp was Windows only for the last, I think, 20 years. Um, no, I'm not 20 years. Maybe it's only 15 years. Um, but now there's .NET Core, which is officially supported for Microsoft on Linux, OS X, and Windows. So you can work on that, but of course, you don't have Visual Studio, which is a really good IDE on either Linux or OS X. Um, there's an open source IDE from Microsoft, Visual Code, I think it's called, which I think even some people here use for, for small edits, which works with C Sharp pretty well. And there's also from IntelliJ, uh, the Rider IDE, which is also built for C Sharp, but it's a very early state, so it's, I think, not even a year old. 
So of course, the experience is not as smooth with, as with PHP or Java. It's for, at least for our company, it's a new language, it's C Sharp, which is a really, really nice language, which also is, should be familiar for everyone with, familiar with Java and, uh, and PHP, because of course, some things are just different uh, and it's a, that's a risk. And also the ecosystem is new, um, for us at least. Uh, and probably also the thing is that it's still a small community. So this Project Orleans is not like the React, like the next big framework everyone's talking about, but it's still kind of kind of small and a niche framework. So if you just Google for problems, it might be that you're the first one to find that problem and you just solve it on your own and cannot just use Stack Overflow. Um, which doesn't mean that it's not in use. So the biggest users right now are the matchmaking uh, process for Halo 4, I think, and Gears of War 4. So two very, very large online games, which have like worldwide billion, millions of users and probably a million users even at the same time. So it works in practice and it can scale out. Uh, so we would not be the biggest users, I would say. Yeah, then some, some outlook. Oh, I don't have of my time anymore. Yeah. Uh, so there's even some built-in event sourcing uh, for this uh, for this model. So you can load your state basically from an event source uh, for, for for the grain, um, which I didn't have time to look into yet. Right now, there's also built-in support for stream processing, so you can easily hook into, for example, Kafka or other streaming systems, and then get those events into your grains and process them. Um, then uh, in beta is also indexing. So like I said, this use case, for example, oh, give me all the actors, for example, all the rides with, uh, I don't know, where the number of passengers is larger than two. Right now, you cannot do that because you don't have an index on your thing. You would need to query every single ride for that. And they're working on indexing. Then geo-replication, I think, is actually right now in beta. So you can replicate the cluster in multiple locations and have them synchronize the state. And also the transactions, which I talked about, are also coming. Yeah, so what are the benefits, um, if that's not obvious yet to you, what the benefits are? Uh, benefits are, of course, reliability. You don't need to care about a lot of things that could go wrong in a distributed system. Um, and the scalability, in the end, you will just add more nodes to the system and it will scale out. And you hopefully will not have problems like eventually, for example, overloading your database um, because you keep all your state locally. And simplicity. So a lot of distributed problems become really, really simple in this framework. And I would say that complex problems become possible to solve. That you wouldn't, right now, for example, you would probably need 10 Rabbit and Q's system, for example, to handle payments. Or maybe not 10, but at least more than one. <laughs> yeah, Alex is just shaking his head. Um, but all of those things they need to handle state, talk to other actors, become, let's say, I would say, possible to solve. Um, and that's it for me. Do you have...